Visit stogiegeeks.com forward slash debonair for a list of retailers who carry debonair cigars. Buy some today and get a little more debonair. Welcome back to the Stogie Geek Show. Will Cooper from Studio C in North Carolina. This is episode 190. I'm joined by my special co-host, John, the cigar surgeon, Reiner. Um, before we get into the debonair idea, I just want to address, I got a couple of messages from the last segment. Um, clarification, yes, I do have a daughter as well as three sons. Um, I, I kind of made the analogy that Paul and I are Thai in terms of sons. But, yeah, I have the overall edge on kids, I guess. So thanks for the clarification. I didn't forget about my daughter there, so to speak. But uh, anyway, um, so I'm here with um, John, the cigar surgeon. Actually, he also goes by a different, another name. He's the Conscious Canadian. Um and tonight for the Debonair Ideal segment, uh, I actually thought it would be a good discussion point because given right now the um, environment we're in, the cigar industry in the U.S. where a lot of our audience is, you know, we hear a lot about what goes on in Canada with cigars. And I've heard some information. Some of it I think may be true. Some of it's not. So we have, we have a conscious Canadian on John Reiner, as you can see. Um, I even think that's yeah, the Canadian flag. I just want to make flag. sure. Yep. Um, and we're going to talk a little about cigars in Canada. So, John, just um, I, I know you mentioned that Calgary, Alberta, is it's north of Montana, right? Yep. So it is in the I'd say it's it's it, obviously it's the western provinces right now. You got it. Um, you know the big thing I hear, okay, right now one of the things that is potentially down the road with regulations, it's not been written into a regulation yet, is the idea of walk-in humidors. Yep. In terms of there's talk that they want to eventually take um, the ability for a consumer to walk into a humidor and actually be able to touch, touch and smell the product. Now, they actually, the FDA said this time around they're not preventing customers from doing that, although there's been talk about that. And I'll also say I've heard retailers, there are, uh, there's a good chunk of retailers actually who already do not allow their consumers to walk into a humidor. They work with counters, which it, there's advantages to that because they're... Um, a lot of them, they feel a lot of them to be more of a hands-on tobacconist. So it's not um, as well as prevent damage product. But I guess, John, the question I have right off the bat is, is that true in Canada? Because I've heard mixed stories that people have been able to walk in the humidors in Canada. So it's it very much set up like the United States, where every province acts like a state within the United States. So there is tobacco legislation that's unique to, well, I shouldn't say unique, because it's, it's a gradient scale. Each province in you know in uh, Canada has its own particular rules, ranging from draconian to just outright insane. And you know, I think you know with this FDA legislation, I say as a Canadian, it doesn't surprise me. And I've been preaching for I would say at least three or four years to everyone who would listen that this doesn't surprise me this, that that this has been coming. And you know, a lot of, heard a lot of feedback from people that they said, well, I don't think it's going to be that bad. I think people need to realize. This is the first iteration. This is not yep. the final iteration. This is the first iteration of the FDA, and people are already shocked. And I think they should brace themselves because this is how it starts. This is how it started in Canada. This is how it's going to start in the United States. Yeah, and we could definitely go down that road. You know, I've heard, you know, and there's a lot of obviously talk that the industry, and it, I don't think it's talk. I think it's clear the industry is divided. There are some yeah. folks that want to challenge this. There's some folks who don't want to challenge this. And it's it's my fear if they don't challenge this. We've already seen a little bit of that, John, in the U.S. Because I'm going to go back 20 years ago, okay? And, and you're, you, you and I are close to the same age, even though you look about 10 years younger than me, <laughs> right? But I remember when the smoking bans started with the restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I'm going back to the mid-'90s. And, and it was really, hey, look, we, don't want, we just want to have smokers in their own section. And, you know, we're not, you know, we want to keep the non-smokers separate. That's all we're looking for. Let's, you know, pass some legislation. And everyone said, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Seems reasonable, right? Yep. And then, yep. And then it became, then the next round came, well, we want to make 
75 percent of the smoking area. I mean, non restaurants non smoking. So they took away that. And now today, it, again, it, it is on a state by state basis here, but. A lot of states, you can't smoke in restaurants anymore. So there's mm-hmm. a precedent already that this has happened in the U.S. right now. So, I mean, one of the, one of the main rules, certainly within my province, and I, you know, I've come to know the rules here very well, you absolutely cannot walk into a humidor unaccompanied. It, and I, I feel for our customers because I'm sure to them it seems like, well, is this guy word? I'm, I'm sure the first thought is this guy word. I'm going to pocket something or steal something, and it's not very debonair to 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 not let a customer into a humidor to browse your product. And in Alberta, and certainly other provinces, you are not allowed to touch tobacco product. You physically cannot interact with that tobacco product until you pay for it. So that's that's a real interesting point. So in other words, it's not even like in the U.S. where a lot there are retailers that have the counters. Mm-hmm. But a lot of times the customers can't touch the product before him. But in this case, you're saying you have to make that purchase before you're allowed to smell or touch the product right now. Yeah, that's right. And you can imagine in a, in a cigar environment, especially with cigar smokers, you don't want to be, you know, this is sales 101. You don't want to be looking over a guy's shoulder as he walks through the humidor because it feels oppressive. It doesn't feel like they have the opportunity to browse and relax in the humidor. And you have to, it's almost with every customer interaction, you have to explain, look, I'm not worried that you're going to take something. By law, I cannot let you in the humidor by yourself. By law, I cannot let you touch the product until you pay for it. And it, you almost have to do that on a per-interaction basis. It gets a little old after a while, I'll be honest. So it's not counters. You have walk-in humidors. Mm-hmm. But in other words, it's like the kid going into a department store, a toy store, and can't touch the toys. Uh-huh. So it that, makes everyone feel like a criminal almost, right? Yeah, it does. So is there... Um, I mean, do some of the retailers put, like, glass or something? Because I, I, I could see that, or put cabinets in there so they can't, so customers, because I could, I could see that being a pain in the ass. <laughs> it is. Like, having to remind people about that. It is. And, I mean, I think there's really a delineation between where the majority of tobacco products are sold, which is probably very similar to the United States, where the majority of tobacco products are sold at convenience stores or gas stations, and then the premium products are sold through tobacconists and tobacco shops. And that's very similar to the way we have it set up here. And I would say that the vast majority of tobacco shops absolutely have a walk-in humidor because in this environment, you can't possibly attract cigar customers, premium cigar smokers, without having a walk-in humidor. So there is, it, it is a tough tightrope to watch, to walk, absolutely. Interesting. So you yep. mentioned that there are certain provinces that are a little more friendlier to the cigar enthusiasts, and then there are some you mentioned that are draconian. What are some of the, like, say, more friendlier cigar provinces for people going to Canada? So, I, and I, sh- I shouldn't surprise anyone, the head of our, our country is in Ottawa and Ontario, the province of Ontario, which is eastern Canada. And of course, they, they have the lowest tax rate on tobacco, and they have some of the loosest rules, and I say loose, and, and it is gr- shades of gray in terms of what they can and can't do. Now, technically, by federal statute, they're not supposed to be able to ta- touch tobacco product. Now, in Ontario, it's kind of one of those things where Ontario says, well, we don't really have that rule. So for the most part, you walk into a humidor in Ontario, you can interact with the tobacco products. It's not, no one's going to slap your hand. No one's going to get over your shoulder. But for most of Canada, you cannot walk in a humidor and touch that product by yourself. And how about like some of the more draconian, stringent, you know, provinces? Well, sadly, my province, unfortunately, is one of the most draconian provinces out there. So we have the strictest rules in terms of smoking laws. We have the strictest strictest rules. And the really killer is the tobacco taxes, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we essentially have gone from, you, you kind of led to it, where we started out with, you know, well, let's ban smoking in restaurants and bars. And, you know, okay, well, I don't like coming home from a bar smelling like cigarette smoke. That's, you know what, that's all right. But really what happened was it was a wedge issue where you banned smoking everywhere. So it wasn't, well, you've, I've got still got a place to smoke, right? No, you can't smoke anywhere. And of course, I don't need to tell you, up here in Canada, we have seasonality. So there, there's very like we're sitting out on a patio right now. I'm enjoying a delicious cigar. I'm relaxed. It's warm. It's comfortable. But in six months, that's not going to be the case. And I'm, in, I'm not going to have any place to smoke. Yeah, for folks who haven't seen uh, John on Cigar Federation, when he's out there in December, 
<laughs> doing the show. And he, you would think he's in Maui. He doesn't flinch. He's not freezing. There's no icicles coming from the eyes. Yeah, it's amazing when he's he done that. It gets a little chilly. I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be a tough guy. It gets pretty chilly. I got a couple layers of thermal underwear on because I gotta protect the twig and berries. Right. So you mentioned um, you mentioned taxes um, as far as that goes. So there's obviously different provinces. Which is which is the lowest tax and which is the highest tax? So Ontario is the lowest, and I believe, and I'm I'm, I'm should know this off by heart, but I believe one of the eastern. Uh, per, uh, one of the eastern uh, provinces, and I want to say it's New Brunswick or Newfoundland, is the highest. But I think Alberta ranks either number two or number three across Canada in having the absolute worst tobacco taxes by far. Right. How, and how, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, go ahead, dude. You go. I was going to say, so I want to put that into perspective for people to, you know, because I know that, you know, there's stories that are told and people say, well, that can't possibly be true. It's That seems outrageous. Just to give people a sense. Just in the federal level, there's a $22.89 per thousand, so, thousand cigar excise tax. It doesn't seem that bad. That's the starting point. Then on top of that, you add 82% of the duty paid value of the imported cigar. So what, so what that value that cigar is that comes in, then you add another 82%. And it's adjusted every five years for inflation. That's, that's the starting point. That's the base level of a tobacco landing just in Canada before it gets to the provincial level. Bring it into Alberta, then you add another 129% of the taxable price. What's the taxable price? Well, the taxable price is taking that excise adjusted and federal excise added amount to to and you times that by 1.3. Now that has a maximum cap, and I know there's a lot of states in the in the U.S. where they say, well, the maximum cap's 80 cents, and people are like, oh, that's crazy, 80 cents. The maximum cap per cigar here, seven dollars and 83 cents. So you can imagine. Wow. Every cigar, if it's a premium handmade product, it's already at $7.83. So to put that into terms that most people understand, let's take a $78 cigar. I'm not going to pick on any manufacturers because it affects everyone equally. But let's just say a $7, $8 cigar that you buy at your local B&M. That's going to land on the shelf here in Alberta at between $28 and $30 a stick. What on? You take an 11 or $12 cigar, so really nice premium handmade product in the United States, that lands on the shelf around $45. Wow. Yeah. So it's not quite, and you guys aren't even at the, and for folks, it, it could get worse because a firm Dave Burke's been on talking about Australia with some of their yep. taxes. But this is still, that's still pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of, are there some, you know, I know, we, so I know we've talked about this, obviously, I would say Canada is a little further along with the restrictions, right? Yep. But let's let's kind of I know and, and I mean, we can we can we'll try to be debonair here and we'll kind of turn <laughs> this a bit, right? Um, what are, what are some of the highlights of the Canadian cigar market in terms of what are some of the brands that really do well up in Canada? I think one of the nice things up here, and I know people say, well, you can go up to Canada, you can buy a Cuban cigar. And that's, you know, that's usually feedback I get. Well, you can smoke Cubans in, in Canada. And that's true. We can smoke Cubans. And I think that's, that is a benefit because the, the, and I would say the typical Canadian smoker has a pretty decent palate because you can smoke anything within the Cuban range. And then you have it access to all of the Nicaraguan tobacco, Dominican tobacco, Honduran tobacco. And I think that's good in a lot of ways because it, it levels the playing field. You can go in and you can smoke a Cuban if you want, but at the same time, you can pick up anything else from anywhere in the world. And I find typically that we have a pretty broad range of appreciation of tobacco. You don't have, I mean, you still have the one guy who wants to buy his $8 cigar, $10 cigar, and you go, okay, well, if that's what you like, that's great. But within the sort of stogie geek community, you have guys, they might bring out a Cuban, but by the names, by the next stick, they might bring out, you know, something from Hawaii to Nicaragua because that's, They'll smoke the entire range. And it's kind of refreshing to, to think that all of those products are available and most most cigar smokers don't limit themselves to one particular type of product. So it's it's kind of like here, you know, again, you go back in the U.S. 35 years ago, there were guys very, very uh, cigar loyal. Yeah, so, but, absolutely. But there it's kind of it's similar to the U.S. where it is today where people are, are just really trying different things right now. 
Yeah, and I think one of the on, on, I don't know if this is fortunate or unfortunate, but one of the one of the byproducts of this sort of price discrepancy up here is that there isn't this huge price gap. So you end up having a pretty level playing field in terms of price. You can pick up, you know, a, a product from um, uh, just pick on uh, Drew Estate. So you can pick up a Drew Estate product, and in a lot of cases, the Drew Estate product is cheaper than the Cuban product. So it, it gives you a flexibility as a tobacconist to say, well, you know, you've got all of this range of Honduran, Dominican, or, or Nicaraguan product, or you can pay 5 or $10 more a stick and you can get a Cuban. Now there's going to be those diehard Cuban cigar smokers who say, well, I, you know, I only smoke Cuban. Okay, that's great. Here are all your Cuban products. But it gives you some wiggle room as a tobacconist to make some good recommendations if someone's willing to try something outside that Cuban market there's, I mean, obviously, there's a whole world of tobacco open to them, and adding a five or ten dollar discount or you know less price to that makes it a little bit more approachable for them too. Excellent. What would you say in Canada is a the most popular brand right now? I don't, I, you know, it's it, and and I kind of did some research because I was looking through our because I work for a, a chain of cigar stores, so I was kind of looking through some of our sales, and it's interesting because we don't really have one cigar that, you know, stands out in terms of our humidors in our various stores, everyone kind of buys a wide range. And and, and and I guess in a way that makes it tough as a B&M because you have to have a broad spectrum of product from the Connecticut shade light cigars all the way up to the full-bodied cigars. Um, you know, highlight of some of, the, some of the products that really sell well, of course, our, our friends Mombacho, uh, Canadian manufacturer, um, they their product sells really well. It's at a good price point. It's a solid Nicaraguan cigar. Um, there's another Canadian company, a Dominican cigar company. They have a couple different blends, both in the sort of the fuller, uh, fuller end of spectrum, and then in the medium end of spectrum that sell really well. And they're priced accordingly because you know they understand how complicated it is in the Canadian market. And then within the the uh, Cuban market. You know, a lot of people think, well, Cohiba, 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 but it's not Cohiba. The number one selling Cuban cigar, Monte Cristo number two, believe it or not. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. Now, what is a brand that, and John, you spend a lot of time in the American market. I know you and I have gotten Absolutely. together in Orlando and, and other places. What is a brand that's in the U.S. that I would say you would say is a, a, a better known brand, but maybe not found in Canada right now. Well, I think what the pain for us is that Stogie Geeks are Stogie Geeks, whether they're in Canada or the United States. And I think Stogie Geeks are informed. They know what product is out there. And, you know, not to throw anyone under the bus, but not everyone buys the product here in Canada because a lot of that product isn't available in Canada. It's a huge hassle for a lot of the boutique companies especially, you know, a lot of, the, there's been a lot of boutique companies that have come out in the last five, six years. They don't want to go through the trouble of importing their product and going through a distributor here in Canada. It's very expensive. It's very laborious. And it's not, you know, the market here is obviously a fraction of what it is in the States, but that doesn't stop Canadian cigar smokers from wanting to enjoy that product. So, you, you know, you look at your top 10 boutique cigars, like the Maya Selvas and the Nomads and the, and the, um, the, uh, uh, Gosh, now I've completely drawn a bank. But, uh, uh, you know, you look at all those different products that are on the market, and Canadian cigar smokers are aware of them, and they enjoy them. They just can't buy them here. So, inevitably, they either have to take advantage of their duty-free allotment traveling down in the United States, or they have to find a different way of getting that product up here in Canada. And this is what I'm seeing, what I'm going to see happen in the U.S. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to be regulated. I hate the break the news i don't well, there's going to be some level of regulation what the extent is i don't know but this gray market i believe is going to now i believe it's going to be europe and asia who's going to who's going to now own this market until they they knock it down but i yeah. think you're going to start to see that's how the u.s consumer base is going to be here you go because there's going to be companies that still want to sell product and i think they'll find those places i think i'm really looking at europe countries like germany and the netherlands i'd really keep an eye on over the next couple of years if i had stock in in a distributor that I'd buy stock in those distributors right now. Mm -hmm. Because you, I mean, you see it already, you know, people talk about, well, Americans can't smoke Cubans. Well, technically they can't, but that doesn't stop 20% of the world's supply of Cuban cigars still going to the United States on the, on, I don't know if you call it the black market, but the gray market. And the same is absolutely true of Canada. There's a huge, a huge consumption level of tobacco product that's not available in Canada. That's still finding its way here in Canada because 
Canadian cigar smokers, the, the stogie geeks that are out there, they're not going to be dissuaded. They want to continue smoking. They want to smoke quality product. And if they can't get their hands on the Room 101s, well, then they're either going to have to find a way to get them or they're going to find some way to get them up here. And, and they're not going to be dissuaded by that. Excellent, excellent. Well, John, that was a, a very, I mean, appreciate giving some really good insights to the, uh, myself and the audience on that. Um, we're going to take a quick break and we'll talk with John a little more about what's happening in the world of Cigar Federation. So stay tuned. Welcome back to the Stogie Geek Show, episode 190. Will Cooper in Studio C in North Carolina. Mark and the team up in Rhode Island, powering things from the G-Unit Studios. Special guest host tonight is John Reiner, a.k.a. the Cigar Surgeon and um, the Conscious Canadian. So, John, uh, I-, I followed you for a long time, and, you know, we, you know, Stogie Geeks, uh, we had a great run over at Cigar Federation. Uh, I think it was a great relationship that we had. Um, and one thing we really enjoyed is we enjoyed being part of that network. Um, and-, and Cigar Federation, it's a social network, and you got a network of some great programming right now um so why don't you just kind of run us through with some of the programs that are on cigar federation right now and, and those different brands of those programs thanks brother so we uh we of course have our core show which is cigar chat i think everyone's pretty familiar with cigar chat by now every uh thursday night at 8 p.m eastern standard time we've got uh industry people on the show which is a lot of fun but we've decided to expand the portfolio and i'm sure as you're aware the podcast community that's out there is enormous. So, uh, of course, we've got Seth and uh, Yellow Tuna June, who do uh, What Habargo on Monday. That's a great show. I tune in every week to, to listen and, and tune into their antics because it's a lot of fun. <laughs> we've got uh, Pipe Dummies on Tuesdays um, because there is a growing community or a, a sizable community of pipe smokers out there. And actually, the timing of the show is fantastic because we're actually at... The, believe it or not, the two-year anniversary, and I can't believe how fast it's gone, the two-year anniversary of um, my show, which is Sharing Our Pairings, which wow. we started yeah, two years ago, June 11th. Um, and that's, uh, of course, every Wednesday where uh, typically it's Robbie and I. We, we do pairings with uh, spirits or, or whatever with cigars. And, uh, yeah, it's been it's been a good run. I don't know that we have any more room for additional shows because we're, we're kind of running out of days of the week at this point. No, so... What, you know, and, and the Sharing's Our Pairing show, I think, well, I mean, all of all four of the shows, I think, are unique. I mean, obviously, Pipe Dummies, uh, there are pipe podcasts out there, but I think the what I like about that show is it, it really, you guys come across as, um, I don't want to say, the dummies, I hate the word dummies, but you guys are basically <laughs> learning as you go along on that, which I, yeah. I like. It's a very fr- fresh and honest approach, and I always find what we do, John. People say, you know, we get a lot of, they get a lot of great information from me. But to believe it or not, when, as I'm sharing information, I learn tenfold. And, and that's what I see with that show is I see I, that same thing happen with that particular show. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, I'm, I've been on the show as a guest, but I'm a real pipe dummy. I think what I like about the show is that they don't approach it from a perspective. And, and I don't think that anyone does, but I don't think they approach it from a perspective that they're experts on pipes and they're really sort of documenting the journey of i start you know i've started out as never really touching a pipe and starting out learning how to pack a bowl and figure out what pipe tobacco i like and then just expanding from there so i think when people tune in they they, they're faced with that experience to say look we're not going to preach to you we're just going to tell you this is our experience and give us your feedback and and kind of evolve from there and i think the show has been an interesting evolution i like to tune in because you know for me pipe tobacco is kind of a gray area of knowledge there's a lot of guys out there that know a lot about pipe tobacco and it's tough to find that right show that makes it approachable without running over and, and losing me immediately with the amount of knowledge they're dropping. Oh, I totally agree. I, that's what's I think really good about that particular show, you know, and then you have, like I say, the, the mothership is cigar chat. And, and this is how I read cigar chat. <laughs> it's, it's so cigar federation is a community and it's, you know, you look at cigar Federation, cigar dojo. Uh, I know you were part of Reddit one time their communities, but what, what I love about what you guys have done with Cigar Chat is you've taken that community and you've made an extension of it into a show. So a lot of that show is driven by the audience in terms of the questions that come in there, which I think yeah. is a real unique feature. 
Yeah, and I think that's really the platform we're looking for is we don't want to be, you know, there's a lot of high-end sites out there that, and, and you and I both view them probably daily or multiple times daily, but we what we really wanted to was to find that niche where we could take the average cigar smoker, the average stogie geek out there and bring them into the show and make it interactive to say, look, if you've got concerns, if you've got questions, if there's, you know, if we've got a special guest on, we want you to kind of interact with them and have a chance to, you know, it's not that you're on the show, but feel like you're on the show and feel like they're talking directly to you. And I think that's been a fun journey. It's been a fun experience. I know uh, I enjoy the show just as much listening to it as I do being a, being a guest on the show. It, it really is. It's like I said, and I love how some of the questions are driven from the audience. It's just really good. And then we talked about Robin and, uh, Rob, Rob and Logan being the, uh, yin and yang, which I think, <laughs> um, Yes, it, it there's a real and that works real well. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it was just a few weeks ago we kind of played with the idea of not having a guest and just having Rob and Logan just talk and just the interaction between the two of them is they've got a great dynamic and we talked kind of before the show they think it's that sort of 50s style dynamic where you've got the straight man and you've got the funny man and they kind of play off of each other and they give each other barbs it makes for pretty entertaining uh, podcast if not a live show i mean like i said i i've been dr- i've been driving on the road a lot lately and it it keeps me pretty entertained for the drive oh i totally agree i've i've, I've put a few of those in as well and then, then of course, you mentioned um, the What Embargo show with uh, Seth Big Tuna, guys, and uh, June Yellow Snap Lou. Now, I, I know Seth a long time, and so I consider him one of my closest friends, period. He's like a brother to me, and I, I've gotten to know June real well. And they are very, very knowledgeable on Cubans. But what I can tell you is that's, 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 they bring such a real element with their personalities yeah. on that show. That that's how you know yeah, they bust balls exactly. <laughs> I, I've seen it says bust some balls, but it did. I mean, <laughs> so I mean that's and I, but like I said, there is not a show out there as far as I know, and and maybe there's one internationally, but I don't know a regular podcast that's pretty much dedicated to the Cuban market right now. I I agree, and I think that that slots in really nicely. I mean, there are some sites that do Cuban reviews and there's some sites that do a little bit of talking about Cuban and a little shout out to Friends of Obanos who do a really great sort of short show but there isn't you're right I don't think there is a show at least I if there is one email me but I don't know of a show out there that really is dedicated and focused for a full hour just on Habanos cigars so it it does fit in there nicely exactly and then we come to your show um, sharing our parents you know I didn't realize was two years old and that show, like I said, again, I don't know if there's a show out there that's dedicated to pairings. Now, Paul and I have talked about a pairings uh, from time to time, um, but, but this show is, is really a show that's actually, and I've been a guest on that show, and I've had a lot of fun doing that. Why don't you talk a little about the concept with that show? Sure, and and we've absolutely had a lot of fun with you on the show, and certainly having Paul on the show, and and, and just to speak in the broader community, I think what's great about the broader podcast and, and live show community is that we all are brothers. Just as if we were sitting in a cigar lounge, we are lovers of the leaf. You know, we all sit down, and at the end of the day, we're all in it together in one big pool. Um, but yeah, this was sort of a brainchild that actually goes back more than two years. Rob and I were kind of tossing back the idea that you know there is this kind of natural tendency when you're not reviewing a cigar which you know hopefully you have some time to to enjoy a cigar on your own i like to enjoy a cigar with a beer or a wine or a whiskey or a cocktail or whatever that's kind of how i typically smoke a cigar and we said well look there's not really anything out there focused on it there's certainly companies out there that are releasing blends that are dedicated to that and we see great reviews out there there's lots of fantastic review sites and that gives you a great text review but that's it's to me, it felt like a bit of a hollow experience. I mean, I read the review and I thought, okay, that sounds interesting, but I wanted more. And so Robbie and I tossed the idea around for probably eight months before we just decided, I think Logan just, as he said, kicked me in the ass and said, look, you just got to do the show. And, you know, the first couple episodes were a little rough, but we kind of found our uh, found our voice. And, you know, it's a lot of fun to not only do pairings with different things, but we've transitioned certainly this year to having a lot of industry guests on the show. And I think they enjoy the fact that they can come on the show. It's not scripted. 
Um, you know, we are on the Armed Forces Radio Network, so we have to keep it clean for the first hour, but they can kind of just be themselves. They don't have to necessarily answer questions. They just have to talk about their expertise, which, which is cigars and what they, what they like to pair. And that, that, to me, is really the fun of the show. No, I totally agree. You know, you mentioned whip pairings. Um, you also write reviews on Cigar Federation, too. Absolutely. Now, when you review a cigar, do you review it with a pairing or not? I, I am uh, staunchly a, a person that believes that the only, if you're doing a review, you, first of all, it has to be in a clean palate or as clean as palate, palate as possible eating food. But you really should only be pairing with water or as Jose Blanco says, you know, with the, with the um, carbonated water. Because otherwise, you're really tainting that review process. And I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. But from my perspective, for me and for our site, and I know for you guys especially, you want to approach that and give that cigar as much chance as possible to sort of come out and give all the flavors that are there without being possibly influenced by anything else. And I think that's really important. We want to be as honest as possible with our with our viewers and our reviewers as we can. And I think it's just fair to the manufacturers to give them a fair shake at their, their cigar products. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll kind of agree with you, but I will say there are some very good sites out there that they always do pair it with something. Yeah. But I think they, they, the fact that they disclaim that, I think is okay that they're disclaiming that. Absolutely. It, it's a different type of review. It's not that it's a wrong review, but in terms of, I agree, I think for the type of, the, goal, the end goal that you and I are trying to do, we probably really need to do it with water. Or, you know, I do a lot of my smoked reviews very, in the very early hours of the morning. Yeah. Uh, I just smoked a power bomb friday like five in the morning uh, don't, <laughs> without eating don't ever do that uh, i'll talk about that cigar next week Fantastic. Um, because paul hasn't smoked it yet and i don't want to give it the cat out of the bag but um and something new but um but yeah so i think that part is 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 okay as far as um that goes yeah i think if I do a review and I want to do a pairing, I will typically do a two-part review, which is obviously more time-intensive. I'll do a review that's just a straight up, as as clinical as possible, and then I'll do a second part of that, which is, you know, when I'm smoking this cigar, this is the beverage that I think that would really go well with it. Here's my take on that, and then I do that as a second part. I don't I don't do it very often because I'm kept very very busy with all the content we're delivering, and of course now that I've got a job in the industry, uh, time is. Uh, Time is hard to come by, so I don't do it all the time. I only do it in very specific circumstances. Yeah, I mean, Paul and I are looking at a cocktail show, but it's not going to be a pairing show. We're going to have, that's going to be a, like, so again, it's something that we're just going to focus it on, a cocktails piece, you know, because again, we, 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 you know, there are other pairing shows, but we think it's something different as opposed to, it'll be no cigars pretty much with that is what we're thinking right now, just to kind of bring a different perspective there. Um, So, you know, you've done a lot of interviews, uh, and I like, like I said, I I like, I think you do a tremendous job. What was what was I'd say the best interview? What was that resume interview that you got to check off uh, when you did it? That's it's tough. I mean, there's as well, as you well know, there's so many personalities within within the industry. Um, I, I was looking at our some of our metrics because I'm a metric focus, oh, focused dude, guy. Me, me too. I'm the yeah. metric guy. Yeah. So I was kind of looking back and like our last year in review, and you know some of the ones that stand out. Anytime you can have JD on the show, I mean. That's a show where you don't even need to write anything. You need two questions, and you could fill two hours of a show, and thousands of people tune in. Um, we recently had, um, gosh, I'm trying to think. Uh, we had Tatuaje. We had Pete Johnson on the show, and Pete's such a such a. So- I want to say he's such a soft spoken guy. Like he's such a humble guy, and he tune he comes on the show, and people just go nuts. Like like. You can't possibly take audience questions and not have a show that's two and a half hours long because the the audience, you know, just they they connect so well with that brand and with that with that person that they just want to they want their chance to they've really become rock stars within the cigar industry and uh you know those are two that kind of stand out on the top of my head there's lots of great guys in the industry that we love having on the show but I think for me those are the two that immediately stand out on the top of my head yeah, no, that's they were, and I've heard both of those interviews. What was the toughest interview you had to do? <laughs> There's been a few, and I, you know, we're not in the debonair segment, but 
I think for me, because, it doesn't have to be that it was a bad interview. Just like yeah. hey, it was tough to pull the interview off. Yeah, there's been a, there's been a couple, and I'm not going to throw anyone on the bus, but I'll just say that for me, what's challenging being on a show is when you ask a question and you get a, a two sentence response. You kind of go, okay, well, you know, this is your this is your passion. This is not just a job. This is your passion. You know, we just had uh, we just had the the great interview with. Uh, with um, gosh, and I've I've had too much beer with Scott Weeks from Recluse, and you know you ask Scott a question, and Scott's trying to pare his answers down to thirty minutes, and I love doing interviews with that because the guy, you know you can just feel his passion for his for his his cigars and the industry that he's in. You don't you don't really need to do much prompting to get him to talk about what he does and his products, and I love that kind of interview because for me and I think for for the audience and certainly I'm sure the Stogie Geeks audience agrees. Those are the audiences, those are the interviews that really do well because people just, they can feel that. They can feel that love for the tobacco. They can feel that love for the cigar. And I think, really, that probably drives a lot of sales because people say, well, I, you know, I just heard this great interview. I got to try his product. He sounds like he's you know, really passionate about that product. I'll just mention what ours was. Uh, it was actually the first show we did on Federation, episode 72, Matt okay. Boots. And <laughs> I, I and I'll just tell it real quick. Um, Matt, I Paul's been doing podcasting a long time, over long ten time. years. And I told him, I said, Matt's going to be an unpredictable guest. He's like, Well, oh, yeah. don't worry about this. I've been doing this ten years, and <laughs> this is going to be you know no problem. So okay, good. Paul's a quarterback, right? Yeah. And Matt gets on that show, and it was like bizarre. And it was he about ha- a third of the way in the interview. Paul goes, We're throwing the script out. <laughs> And we're just gonna, he's just like, and, but it took us, what, what was diff, not that it was a bad interview, it actually challenged us and took us out of our element and comfort zone. Yeah. Like we never were challenged before. Yeah. Matt's, Matt's, I mean, to, to use a football terminology, which I'm sure both you and Paul would love, is Matt is Wildcat 24 7. I mean, you can throw a play at him, you can throw a question at him, and the next thing you know, you're talking about latex and stuff that, Probably moves you way out of your comfort zone. Highly entertaining, but yeah, he is a uh, he is a wild card to have on a show. But uh, certainly very very entertaining for sure. But uh, here's one I'll throw at you guys: get Matt Booth and Caldwell on for a joint interview. Oh and, my god! And, which I had to endure. Now <laughs> <laughs> the difference is, um, I was a little more prepared for that, having interviewed both those guys in the past. But boy, yep. did I boy did they beat the shit out of me in that one. You know, uh, Cal- Caldwell is is such a such a personality. Well, they're all personalities, yeah. right? Um, we had the great opportunity to sit down with Caldwell when we did the uh, coverage down at the um, the Drew Estate uh, Safari we did with the Cigar Federation, and it was really the first time I had to sit down with Caldwell, and you know, just on a one on one basis. And I tell you, like that guy is just he. The, the, if I were to use a word to describe him, it'd be maniac absolute maniac and i know matt we've we've done you know we've done a lot of interviews we've hung out with him matt's a maniac too so put those two guys together on a show i i, I don't i don't even know where you <laughs> i don't even know what you do with that it would just be wild yeah all i know is we were talking about rosie o'donnell donald trump and the canada came up in that interview is all i'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah so yeah <laughs> It was bizarre. Now, in terms of a a bucket list you'd like to check off for an interview, who do you want to interview? You know, if we could get um gosh, I know if we could get Dion on the on the show anytime soon, I know Rob would just lose his mind. Um uh, I would actually, and this is kind of a personal one for me, but Hamlet, um only because Hamlet Hamlet uh, parodies from uh, from who's now with uh, Rocky Patel, but but that's only because I know Hamlet. And I ha- have a friendship with him going back to Cuba. Um, that's kind of a personal thing for me. I'd love to have him on the show. And I think there's a classic example of a guy who's just got so much passion. And y- you know, you when you talk to these guys, you just hang on every word. And really, you, you could sit there for five hours and let them talk tobacco. And every minute of that conversation, you'd just be hanging on every word. Uh, I would love to have him on Cigar Chat. He's a very personable guy. I've gotten, I, I don't know him as well as you do. I've met him. I think he remembers who I am. But he's a very, very personable guy. Great guy in an event. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, I mean, it reminds me of the conversation with JD. So you can have a guy who goes to an event in wherever in the United States with JD, and JD will remember that guy, his wife's name, his kid's name, where he works, and he'll remember this like two years later. And Hamlet's very much the same way. He knows, he'll remember you. And it, these guys have vaults for brains. I wish I had a vault for a brain like that. They'll, they'll remember everything about this person and they'll be able to recall it even a year later after only meeting this person one time. It's, it's, it's incredible, frankly. I'll throw another name into that group, but I agree with both of those. It's Andre Farkas, who we have on, oh, in, two yeah. we have him on in two weeks. Guy's got a photographic memory, and, and I'm telling you, that guy can remember things like, um, yeah, like Rain Man. He, hey, nothing will get past him. I think if Andre didn't have a job in the cigar industry, he could be a very, very successful stand-up comedian. We actually did the, I don't know if people have had a chance to check out our B-roll. Um, we did a B-roll coverage there at PCPR, and full props to Andre. That was entirely as a result of his suggestion from 2014. Really? That was a great job. He, he just said, you know what? You guys got to come up here, start rolling the camera, and just capture all this ridiculous stuff that happens before, during, and after the interview. Because as you well know, Coop, doing interviews and doing this stuff at the IPCPR, it's, it's unpredictable. You have unpredictable owners coming up. You have unpredictable retailers coming up. It's very entertaining. And Andre said, look, just take that, make it into a condensed clip. It'll be highly entertaining. And uh, he was right. I think um, when I went back and looked at the footage, I mean, I was absolutely laughing my ass off the entire time. And uh, yeah, that was uh, full props to Andre. That was 100% his idea. No, I got to say, you know, the Cigar Coop, we're a little more of the, uh, we're a little with the reporter's notebook kind of approach. We don't absolutely. do as many, we don't do as many interviews there. We do a couple here and there, but we don't do as many. But um, I'll say that two, there's two, uh, coverages that I think have done the best job at capturing the pulse of the show. Um, I'll say that Stogie Review has done that over the years where if it's they really have captured the pulse of the show and Cigar Federation over the last few years as well. If you're not at the show, you're going to get the best if you want to know what it's like on that floor. Those two those two brands that do the coverage have been the best out there. And I've been to enough shows to see that. Well, I appreciate the love. I mean, I know that we um, I probably hit your site 10 times a day when I'm looking for research or when I'm looking to, you know, because the, the challenge with reviewer is everyone expects you to know everything. And, it, other, and if I'm not Will Cooper, I can't possibly know everything. I mean, you, your, your mind for tobacco and, and cigar industries and brands is encyclopedic. So when we do reviews, there's, I'm constantly running into stuff. It's like, I don't even know how many Vitolas are within that line. The first thing I do is go to your site and pull it up because I know that, number one, the information is going to be correct. It's going to be timely. And I can feel confident that if I get challenged on it, you know, I know it's correct. So to me, that, you know, that gives me a great starting point for a lot of the stuff. If I don't know it, I know I can come to you guys for sure. We really, we really appreciate that. It's, um, you know, like I said, that's part of what we, we tried to do. I think there's a few sites, there's a few other sites that do a good job. You know, obviously the guys from Half Wheel, their information is yeah. always validated as well for the most Absolutely. part. Um, we have different approaches, but I think in the end, you know, the accurate information is, is something that is real important. And, and we do appreciate that you even think of us with that. All the time, brother. So with that, we'll take a short break. And then John and I will come back and we'll discuss our Stogies of the Week. Stogies of the Week. Stay tuned. <laughs> 